But this is not about generative AI taking over, although perhaps that topic is what we're thinking about events. Uh, but rather to welcome Kashmir Hill to the HLS and the Personal Science Center uh, to talk about her new book, for which there are copies around that are yours to keep. So um, this book belongs to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kashmir, for that generosity and being a publisher of the book. Yeah, thank you, Random House. Um, and I've known Kashmir's work for a very long time and been consistently blown away by it. I remember when Kashmir did a series, I think it was a photo, a series of text fasts trying to figure out what it would be like to unplug from the various letters of like the fame in Africa. Yeah, it was. Uh... Uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple. And all at the same time, but also individually. Yes. Yeah. So that's itself um, uh, a story worth telling at some point. But we have a story right behind us and in front of you, and uh, for at least 150 on webcast as well, so welcome to those in the sky, as it were, uh, to talk about a phenomenon that ran under the radar for quite a while, and it's entirely possible that I first found out about it through Google Play. Um, and when I found out about it, I somewhat pride myself, I think, on not swinging at every pitch, not being excitable about every possible this changes everything moment. And what amazed me about Clearview AI, the company first switched water was the way in which what it did was an amalgamation of holding together of just a few basic things that anyone could have done. In fact, anyone did. Uh, we can tell us in a moment, Kashmir, if the uh, founder of Clearview's reputation is well captured by his previous big app was a add Trump-like hair to any photo app. In the app store, which probably is still available. <laughs> I kind of have to see this book. Yeah. And then uh, thinking about the Bob Dylan quote that we've got nothing, we've got nothing to lose, um, he did what Facebook or Microsoft or others, Palantir even, would not have touched with kind of gold, which was to scrape billions of images, people, get whatever nearby tagging or metadata or other information about them might be available, especially if you're making profiles on LinkedIn or Facebook or Insta or whatever. Do that a billion or more times, and then use some basic image recognition to say, if I'm offered up a photo of someone, a clip from a live stream, photo of somebody walking down the street, Maybe it's never been on the net before. With decent accuracy, can we identify who that person is? The implications of being able to arbitrarily identify anybody um, are pretty staggering. So when I first found out about it, again, I think through your reporting, I was just like, why isn't this a five to one fire? Like, I'm not generally excitable, but I'm feeling very exorcised right now. And like, isn't this what privacy regulation is for? Isn't this what, like, I, I ended up, I co-wrote a short op-ed for the Washington Post that proposed that Clearview AI be metaphorically burned to the ground and burnt salt and over it, um, which resulted in the CEO reaching out to me as part of a kind of um, uh, PR campaign, which he is extremely good. Kashmir will tell us more about. And uh, here we are in 2023, and it seems like the cat is pretty much out of the bag. I can hear about the twists and turns of that, discuss together, and maybe even think about what, if anything, ought to be done next, and how would it be done? And if nothing can be done, then you think something should be done. How is there any hope for privacy more generally if this classroom hypothetical comes to life and cannot be contained? So, Kashmir, over to you. It would be great to get into the topic, however you like, maybe a little bit about your um, 
sort of disposition towards reporting what you bring to the act of being identified as a professional tech reporter and how you got onto this trail specifically. Yeah, so nice to see everybody. Um, so yeah, I identify as a tech reporter. I also identify as a privacy privatist. Um, and part of the reason why is that I've been reporting on privacy and technology for more than 10 years now. It's, it's been kind of my lens on technology. I started a, a blog in 2009 called The Not So Private Parts, and it was just a this collision of, at that point, basically the internet um, with our notions of privacy and writing about, you know, Facebook kind of convincing all of us, for example, to just put our photos on the internet right next to our faces, um, which at the time people were troubled by and, and did lead eventually, you know, more than 10 years later, to something like the UBI that put those two things together. And rather than looking somebody up by name and finding out what they look like, you can look them up by face and find out what their name is. Um, so yeah, I, I first heard about the UAI um, in the fall of 2019, a public records researcher who just stumbled upon it, uh, asking police departments about what kind of technology they were using. And at that point, police were, were they've been using facial recognition technology for 20 years, you know, back to 2000, 2001, and really got a bump from September 11. But it hadn't really worked that well. As far as we knew, the algorithms were pretty clunky. Uh, or bias, you know, like did not work as well on some groups as other groups, and police were limited to uh, essentially criminal mugshot databases and in some states to driver's license photos. My colleague at the time has actually just done a big report about how there were, that things were mixed when it came to facial recognition technology and that police weren't sure how useful a tool it was. But this public records researcher, um, got this PDF from the Atlanta Police Department, and it had some advertising materials for AI describing themselves as Google for faces, uh, stop, stop searching, start solving was a, their tagline, and there was a legal memo in there uh, written by Paul Clement, a very high-profile lawyer, former U.S. Solicitor General, one of the many high-profile lawyers in the orbit of what turned out to be a pretty scrappy startup. People right now are like possible job and consulting on it. <laughs> <laughs> All did not do that over the break. And can you describe what Purdue AI had done? That they had scraped billions of photos from the public internet, you know, without anyone's consent. At that point in time, Purdue had a three billion faces in their database. Today they have 30 billion faces. Um, he said that they had this app that worked with something like 98.6% accuracy. Clement said, you know, my lawyers have tried it within our firm. It, it returns fast and accurate results. And he had been hired by Clearview to write this memo to reassure police officers that they could use Clearview AI without breaking the law, that it didn't violate state privacy laws or any federal laws. And just one quick question there as we go. You said, I think, considerably police officers rather than police departments. And Clearview was just approaching police officers directly. They were offering free trials on various listservs, uh, one called Crime Dex, for example, for financial uh, crimes investigators. And they would say, hey, try this out. You know, maybe you send us an email and we'll give you a 30 day free trial. And so, uh, and this allowed some, like, I heard that NYPD was using it. And I went to NYPD's official spokesperson that are using Clearview AI, and they said they weren't, uh, which later turned out to be I don't know, not, not not the truth. Uh, and what they would later say is, well, we didn't. It wasn't coming to our procurement office, you know, individual officers. Uh, and so yeah, so this is why I'm actually an additional reporting is that officers can just download any technology they want and start using it in investigations without having it vetted, without knowing the background of the app, without knowing you know, how will the algorithm work or who made it. And I was, I was shocked by, by that and many other things about about um, But when, as soon as I saw the memo, the thing I, I, I flashed back to was when I kind of first started covering privacy, there had been this federal workshop in Washington, D.C. I believe it was in 2011. And it was like all the big tech companies, like Google was there, Facebook was there, Apple was there, privacy advocates were there, the ACLU, the 
Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, face recognition is just starting to get good. And you know, Facebook was rolling it out to uh, tag your friends and photos and suggest their names. Uh, Google had, had tried to um, use it to unlock the Android, though it didn't work that well. You could pull up a photo of somebody and that one unlock the Android, leading Google to tell its employees internally, don't use this, it's not secure, uh, even though they were offering it to their customers. Um, we all gathered there to talk about what do we do about this, and what do we do when it actually gets really good. And, and those kinds of people in one room don't often agree on much, but they all agree the one thing that no one should do is build an app that you can just take a picture of a stranger and then find out who they are. And so it was very shocking to me to see this little startup that I hadn't heard of, that no one seemed to have heard of when they talked to experts, that they had gone ahead and done it. Uh, they had accomplished this. And I just immediately, it's like I read this, this, this PDF, this email I got from the public record researcher, and I was just like, I need to find out if this is real. Um, if it is, who's behind it? And that was the beginning of, yeah, I did this expert day in the New York Times that you probably read, um, that let you know about the existence of the interview. And then I just became obsessed with visual recognition technology and how we got here and how the technology has gotten so powerful and why we had never built any guardrails. Uh, you know, we knew it was coming for at least a decade. This is as much a story about people as it is about tectonic forces or institutions or something. But just to tell the rest of the kind of stage setting. Uh, it'd be great to get a little bit more of the institutional pieces uh, in place. So you mentioned that this database started with 3 million, now 30 million, presumably run the photos of people. Uh, this was all scraping. We know that in terms of service, so Facebook, we know this, for instance, as academics, that if we're going to try to do like even just baby steps research on something, it involves scraping a website to get data. Then we're probably violating the terms of service of that website that says don't no, scrape. Scrape is to say to send along a bot, not a little script, and read what's on the page. What was the reaction of the likes of Facebook, which, true to its then name, is pretty clear, autonomously titled what it is, right? Like it's a Facebook. But it's meant for those individual search engines you were talking about. And you're not supposed to just grab everything, and you would think it would go to the defense of its users and try to close that door, but technically or legally. How did the likes of those who ran the platforms that were scraped, how did they react? So the companies were not happy when they found out about the existence of Clearview, um, and they expressed that uh, by sending Clearview cease and desist letters. And so Facebook sent such a letter. Venmo, which is actually one of the first big sources of faces that one well, not that I describe it in the book, but it was one of the, the first uh, big hits he got. Um, Google, LinkedIn, they all sent Clearview a letter and said, hey, you're violating our terms of service. You know, we see this as a CFAA, computer fraud, um, and abuse. Okay. Here fraud, uh, violation, you know, stop doing this, delete the, delete the information you've already scraped from our sites, and, uh, and then that was it. Like, this is, this is just so they in. invested the cost of a stamp. In fact, they sent the letter by regular mail. And to your knowledge, did they really do a I, I I do not I don't I, I don't know I can't say for sure whether Clearview replied or not but they do not seem to have acted on the letters and so the next step if you're a company that sends a cease and desist letter I know there's a lot of lawyers or law students in here so you know you would tend to sue but none of I mean none of these companies have sued Clearview AI and I think the reason why is um, in part because I don't think they wanted to bring more attention to the fact that the the, the horse, what is the expression? The horse was out of the barn, um, that these faces have already been collected from their sites, but also because the law around scraping is, is pretty fraught. Um, and there has been at least one big federal court decision that said it's, you know, um, it's not illegal to scrape. And in many ways, I think people that are advocates for digital rights want us to be able to scrape. As a journalist, I've run into this before 
Uh, I did a story, um, I did a series one year about Facebook's people you may know, that little widget on the site that suggests to you people that you might want to friend because perhaps you know them in real life. And we were trying to understand what was the data going into that? How were they making these creepy connections and you know, linking uh, psychiatrist patients, for example, to each other, suggesting that they might know each other? Uh, and so my colleague and I, Surya Matu, he, just, he um, designed a scraper that would scrape all the suggestions that somebody got. So technically something like that is in violation of the terms of service, but there's many ways in which we want to be able to scrape. And so as a kind of digital rights uh, community, I think we're torn on that. And now it's coming up again and again, not just with Clearview AI, but with these generative AI companies that have gone out and amassed these databases just by scraping the public internet, collecting you know, your, your comments on Reddit, you know, blog posts, New York Times articles, artists' work. And I think as a, as a society right now, we are feeling a lot of um, anxiety about this, that the public comments is kind of getting used in ways that we did not expect when we put our information out there. In some uh, first year property classes taught in this very room, uh, sometimes on the syllabus will be eBay versus Bitter's Edge, a now venerable case in which one website called Bitter's Edge, which nobody's heard of, you can probably know how the case turned out, um, was scraping eBay in order to do a meta auction site. So you could search for toy truck and see what Yahoo auctions, remember Yahoo auctions, and eBay and others were doing. And eBay did more than a cease and desist there. Another reminder that markets eat norms for breakfast. And in that case, it was seen as a threat to eBay's network effects, term of art meaning the more people who use it as a seller, the more buyers will show up. The more buyers there are, the more tempting it is to sell there. And something like Bitter's Edge would have been a way of breaking that cycle because you could go to Bitter's Edge and see toy trucks from lots of auction sites. But that required scraping. And as you say, you could imagine then very salutary uses of scraping for which this is why law school is three years long to learn the doctrinal tools to be able to say, well, this scraping is good and this scraping is bad. But at the moment, um, as you say, it seems that all scraping, except by academics trying to do the right thing, uh, seems to be disfavored. Is there any other stage setting you think is good to do about how, uh, before we get to the personalities and the people who are truly larger than life, and for all I know, um, Hoan is on uh, the webcast right now. I wouldn't be surprised if he weren't tuned in, although he's probably seen your book talk elsewhere. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious if there's any other stage setting we should do structurally, including maybe, what would you say was the apogee of the market and use of Clearview, which is to say, was there a time when anybody could just sign up or a friend of a friend could just start using it at the dinner table to see who was around the table if they didn't quite know them? Um, and of course, by identifying them, you're also being able to see where that photo came from. So you're knowing what kinds of websites they frequent and establish a presence on, should tell you a lot more than just their name. Um, so I'm curious about that, the shape of who has been able to access it over time and what the company's disposition has been to people who want to go to the individual trouble of saying, please take me out of this. Yeah, so, so Clearview in its early days, um, it, it really got started kind of around 2017, 2018. And initially, it, it, uh, the founders, who I guess we'll talk about, but they built this, this tool uh, that could find photos on the internet if you kind of fed a face into it. And on the, they didn't really know what to do with it. They had a product in search of a customer and they were based in New York City. And so originally they thought, let's, let's sell it to New York businesses, which is mainly uh, real estate firms and hotels and grocery stores and so they were just kind of like going around trying to pitch the tool um and they're also trying to raise money one of their one of their first investors ended up being peter Thiel. he gave them two hundred thousand dollars before they were clearview ai they were a tool called smart checker um it should observe at this point peter Thiel, facebook board member facebook board member fiduciary so duty to facebook as a board member 
and investing in the company that's scraping Facebook against the terms of service and got a letter from Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, though, though Peter Thiel has a kind of a history of being in, uh, invested in companies that are making money off of data, whether it's Facebook or uh, a company that will then use Facebook's data. Um, and so they were trying to raise money. And at that point, they were kind of offering Clearview AI pretty freely to people to just to demonstrate its power. So they would give it to investors, say, hey, you know, why don't you test this out? And it was it was a fundraising mechanism. And so a lot of investors went out, they were using it as a party trick, they would use it on, on dates. Um, I, I heard from one person who knew an investor and he said, you know, I invested this in part to make sure that my face isn't in here and my the faces of my friends, he was basically trying to, you know, protect his own privacy while investing in this thing that would uh, intrude on others. And they gave it to um, uh, a New York billionaire who owned a grocery store chain because he was thinking about using it somehow to prevent shoplifters. Uh, he didn't end up installing it in his stores, uh, but he had it on his phone. His name's John Katzmatidis. He's run for mayor of New York before. And so I was talking to him about it and I said, well, was it useful to you on your own phone? And he says, yeah, one time I was having dinner at an Italian restaurant and my daughter walked in and she was with a man I didn't recognize, uh, clearly on a date, and I wanted to know who this guy was. So I had the waiter go take a photo of them. And then I ran his face through Clearview AI and I found out he wasn't a charlatan, he was a San Francisco venture capitalist. I said, are you sure about that? Uh, <laughs> See what you did there. And so, um, so yeah, they were just kind of like handing it out to, to anybody. They were just looking for somebody who wanted to pay for this or give them money to work on it more. And when they were pitching it to a commercial real estate building, uh, the person who was vetting it was their security director. And he used to work for the NYPD. And he said, you know who would really love this? My, my former colleagues at the police department, can I introduce you? And so, he sent an email to them, introducing them to the, the financial crimes department that he used to work with. They had a meeting and the NYPD started using the app and they were like, wow, this is great. And they were telling other officers about it and it just started spreading through the NYPD. And there's this whole whisper network um, in law enforcement that I kind of wasn't aware of before, but where they talk about useful tools to them. And so it just started going from the NYPD to other departments around the country. That is how the FBI heard about it, Department of Homeland Security heard about it, and uh, law enforcement officers around the world. And all of a sudden, Clearview is just handing out these free trials all over the place. And then eventually, departments start, start signing up. And one thing that I found really interesting when I first started looking at Clearview is that historically, uh, facial recognition vendors were charging a lot of money for algorithms, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars per year. Clearview was offering it for about $2,000 a year per subscription. Um, and so it was, it was cheap and it was powerful, which I found out once I started um, investigating Clearview AI, they were trying to keep all of this a secret. They did not want to talk to a reporter. They didn't return my calls. Uh, uh, I was knocking on doors. It was kind of a fruitless um, exercise at first. I think they were hoping I would just go away. And I started talking to police officers and they said, yes, this is incredible. It works like nothing I've used before. Um, one detective in Gainesville said, oh, I had this stack of unsolved, you know, uh, financial fraudster crimes on my desk and I'd run it through the state facial recognition system and gotten nothing. I ran it through Clearview AI and I'm getting hit after hit after hit. This um, might be somebody walking into a Western Union office to receive stolen funds or something. Exactly. Somebody standing at a bank counter who got ill-begotten gains or somebody in the ATM machine. And he said, you know, what was great about it is before I was restricted to looking through kind of Florida people. Um, and now I could look, I was getting, you know, hits on people outside of the country, you know, hits in other states, and it just worked better than anything I used before. And I said, wow, that sounds really great. I'd love to see what that looks like. And he said, well, just send me a photo and I'll run you through it and I'll send you your Clearview results. And then he stopped 
talking to me and he wouldn't return any of my phone calls. And this happened with another officer. He said, it's, he's like, I actually just used it in a sexual assault case this week. Somebody who uh, had taken a photo of her attacker at the bar earlier in the night. It's great, it works really well as long as somebody's not an online ghost. Um, if they have like things on the web, it'll come up. And he offered to run my photo, he ran my photo. There were no results. And he said, that's really strange because I Googled you and you have a lot of photos on the internet. And I said, yeah, like I would expect to have re results here. He said, maybe their server's down. He stops talking to me. Eventually I find out Clearview has put an alert on my face and every time an officer's running me, they are being notified and they're reaching out to officers and telling them not to talk to me. And they blocked my face from having results. And so this was pretty chilling to me. I'm Which wondering... shows the extraordinary <laughs> efforts you'll go to to protect your own privacy. Right. Yeah. And so it shows me, one, they can see who law enforcement is looking for. Two, they can control whether you can be found. And then it just showed me the power of a technology like this. Uh, they were just using it to see, you know, to track me. But when you think about this technology out in the real world, you know, this is a way to track investigative journalists or uh, you know, government officials or your political opposition, you know, you can put an alert on someone's face and they have no idea unless, uh, unless they act on it in some way. And so that is what I find so compelling about facial recognition technology and why I want to write a book about it is all of this tracking that we have all been dealing with for the last, you know, two, three decades in terms of the internet that we've built that can track you everywhere you go, that can compile all this information about you where there's there's cookies on your computers that say you're interested in law or you're a gambling whale or you have some kind of addiction. All that can now be just attached to our face in the real world as we're moving uh, through real environments where we kind of assume we have anonymity. Um, if I might, I'd like to ask for uh, a Vox Pop interlude where um, especially given what we're talking about, even asking people to raise their hands and answer to a question feels possibly intrusive. So we'll do it the way the Internet Engineering Task Force does. I'm going to call for a hum, if you agree, at the count of three, and then we'll see what kind of consensus is in the room. So uh, a few rapid fire questions. From what you've heard or know so far about this tech, um, I'm curious how much you think it is a problem on a scale of one to 10, if you think it is a two or greater, let us know with a hum, one, two, three. All right. If you think it is a six or greater, let me know, one, two, three. Weirdly, it got louder. <laughs> people had a chance to kind of think about the mechanism here. Um, how many people would put this at a 10? One, two, three. All right, well, it's a somewhat self-selected group that arrived. I'm not sure uh, if the webcast would agree. A couple more questions now. Um, there were a bunch of fellow Americans present at the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. They streamed out at the end of a, shall we say, busy day uh, without any arrests being made because it was just enough to try to secure the place. And, uh, there's been a years long effort by law enforcement to identify the people who rioted at the Capitol that day. Uh, let me know with a hum if you would favor the use of Clearview AI to identify what we will suppose are people who otherwise would not be identifiable who were clearly at the Capitol rioting that day. Fair enough? One, two, three. Okay, did you hear it was a disappointed hum, but a hum nonetheless. And last question, unless you want to add any on. Um, I might have been your piece, if not another, who said uh, that there was some sense that the Ukrainian uh, armed forces had been using Clearview AI, which is constantly looking for different markets, to identify uh, Russian soldiers who'd been killed on Ukrainian territory and left unclaimed by the Russians for the purpose of getting their names through whatever Russian social media say had been scraped with their photos and to then be able to reach out to families to let them know that um, their 
family member had been killed fighting for Russia in Ukraine. How many people think that is a salutary good use of Clearview AI? One, two, three. Hmm, that was a thoughtful hmm. That was like, I need a little more time. I don't know, Kashmir, are you surprised at the reactions so far? Um, yeah, I'm surprised that it, it sounds like the same people are humming for all of the different scenarios. Well, that's the magic of the hum, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, one of the reasons I asked the way I did was, I confess, and this is, I already put my cards on the table as somebody who wrote the Washington Post op-ed wanting the company to be done with, who in the January 6th example, it's like, well, it's there. <laughs> Why not use it? And it was used on January 6th. Yeah. yeah. I mean, should that evidence be excluded at trial? We, I think doctrinally, no big deal about the use of it for these purposes. Um, it's the kind of thing that does complicate the story the way you were saying the story of scraping is complicated. I don't know if you have a quick intervention. There may even be, I don't know if they're turned on, a microphone in front of you. Uh, yeah, although the people on the webcast probably can't, but bellow and we'll repeat. Just, uh, yeah. Of course, it's a biased way of asking the question. Uh, sorry, the question was, with, given that I loaded into the question that people wouldn't be found any other way, you know, what gives? And I should say, I think the reason I asked it that way was to give as much momentum as possible to an affirmative answer, given what appeared to be a pretty strong consensus in the room that the thing shouldn't exist at all. And it might mean then in you know, more careful review that there might be plenty of other ways in which you could identify people for which it's like, why are we doing proof of work where you have to spend more money to get to the same place? Also opens the question of, is the problem with this that it doesn't work, that it's misidentifying folks and putting them in the crosshairs when it's not underwriter laboratories tested as a technology, it's this weird proprietary thing, or is the problem that it does work often when other things don't? And at least some of your Reporting seems to say there are plenty of instances at the moment where it works when virtually nothing else will. Yeah, I mean, facial recognition technology, and that's part of the story of the book. For a long time, it really did not work very well, even as we were, were actively deploying it, and I find that very troubling. It has gotten very powerful in recent years because of all of these advances in machine learning and pattern recognition, the kind of neural net technology that's driving other kinds of advances, why we're seeing magical seeming things like um, chat GPT. Um, on that question, so yes, on January 6th, it was used. You know, the FBI uh, essentially did screenshots from all of the social media that resulted from the intrusion, um, the, the uh, invasion of the, uh, the Capitol and put the photos out there and said, help us identify these people. And at that point, FBI didn't seem to be using Clearview, but all of these local police departments were. And so they would take the FBI photos and then run them through Clearview. And if they got a match that they felt was credible, um, where you know they found other photos on social media of that person wearing the same outfits, they would send it to the FBI as a tip. Um, as you said, there are probably other ways to identify those people, even you know, eyewitnesses maybe. The most passionate users I've talked to of Clearview AI have been child crime investigators who often will come across abusive images of children like on the dark web or in some kind of random account where they cannot figure out, you know, who that account belongs to or whether that's the person who originated the image. And so Clearview, they say, is, is really an unprecedented tool for them because um, so one of the, the one of the cases that basically convinced the Department of Homeland Security to get a subscription was they had this image. Uh, it was found in a Syrian user's Yahoo account. They could tell it was from the US because of the power outlet in the photo. You could tell it was somewhere in America and that's all they knew. And so they run the photo through Clearview AI. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes this is helpful for identifying the victim. Uh, Clearview AI is one of the first, I think, uh, at the time was the only 
database that these investigators had access to that had children's faces in it, so you could possibly identify the child. But for the abuser, um, they found this photo of him in the background of someone else's Instagram photo, and he was standing behind this, uh, this booth that linked him to a particular company based in Florida. The investigator followed the breadcrumbs and eventually located this man in Las Vegas. Um, he was arrested, he's in jail now, you know, the child was removed from the abusive situation. So these are kind of scenarios in which Clearview AI might be the only tool that, that helps them solve the crime. Um, and so that is a powerful use case. And this has been powerful for Clearview AI. You know, as I told you, they weren't originally designing this tool for law enforcement, but once it proved popular for law enforcement, it is the most effective argument that they have when people say, hey, this raises huge privacy issues. You know, none of us consented to be in your database. Why do you have the right to put us in there? Um, they say, well, we're just using it to help police. We're only using it to solve crimes. And this is, I mean, it's gotten them out of trouble several times now. And just this month, uh, so there's a very different approach to privacy here and in Europe. And in Europe, you, um, the privacy laws there say, if you wanna collect sensitive information from citizens, uh, like your biometrics, you need to get their permission first. So when I exposed Clearview AI, privacy regulators outside the US investigated them and said, this is illegal, you can't do this, kicked Clearview AI out of their, out of their countries. And some of them fined Clearview. And so the UK privacy regulator, the British privacy regulator was one of those people who issued a fine. It was for around $9 million and Clearview appealed and they just won that appeal. And the reason was jurisdictional. The appeals court there, the tribunal court said essentially that the UK privacy regulator doesn't have jurisdiction over how foreign governments use uh, data about their citizens. So specifically because Clearview is, say, says they're only working with law enforcement, it allowed them to get out of this fine, which is, which is fascinating. And the UK privacy regulator can still appeal that and they, they might, um, but it really, it raises this problem of how, like how do we regulate a technology like this that is so global that you have companies around the world that are doing this, that are scraping information from all over the place it really starts to look like this international problem that we have to address. So there's so many directions we could go right now. So in the spirit of a choose your own adventure book, um, is it best that we open the door and talk about some of the personalities and the people for which you devote a lot of time to that? And I know there's an interesting Trump MAGA world connection. Should we uh, attempt a demo on the fly of PIM eyes for which there's um, now some competition to Clearview, um, or should we take questions? Uh, and uh, you're welcome to try to multitask too. I don't know what. Uh... Um, maybe one one news you can use uh, <laughs> in terms of regulating Clearview. There um, there are privacy laws here, and we don't have anything basically at the federal level that addresses what Clearview's done. Uh, but there are state privacy laws that are very relevant. And uh, several states now have passed um, the right to access information that a company holds on you and the right to delete it. And so if any of you are from California, Connecticut, Colorado, or Virginia, you can go to Clearview AI and Remember, say, domicile is intent to reside. Yeah. <laughs> you can go there. Uh, if you have any kind of address that links you to one of those places, you can go to Clearview AI and say, I want to see my report and uh, you can ask to be deleted from the database. Um, I, I don't think that opt-out laws work that well. I looked at California also requires companies to say how often they get these deletion requests. And California has 34 million residents. And in the last two years, something like 700 of them have deleted themselves from Clearview's database. About so, 20 are probably in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't work that well. Um, uh, but yes, do you, should I try to do the demo just so you can see what this looks yeah, like? Yeah, why don't we give it a quick shot? And I mean, technology demos never go wrong, especially when they're not <laughs> planned. But um, let's take a look. So 
So one of this, I oh, mean. Oh, good. Okay, and there's a picture on the desktop of us. Okay, let's see if we get uh, it. And you're logged so in already. To, so go to upload photo. I'm going to go, and do we need to share this screen with the Zoom? Should we do that real quick? So this is not Clearview AI. Clearview AI is restricted to law enforcement use, but as Jay-Z was saying when he was kind of doing the introduction here, the what Clearview did was, um, was, made possible by tools that are increasingly open source and off the shelf. And so Clearview kind of, uh, uh, I say that they made a ethical breakthrough, not a technological one. They were willing to do what other companies like Google and Facebook hadn't been willing to do. And now they've had copycats. And so, no, it's not. It's no, that, not was a, that was a long distance shot of us. Let's try, you also put on the one with your sunglasses. Should we try that? And so now we do have these other companies that have done the same thing that Clearview did. So this is a... Now there is a, yeah, there's a gate here. You have to check these boxes or it's not going to do the scan. So Tim Eyes is supposed to be only to search for your own face. And you do have to check a box that says I'm only, this is my face and I have permission to search it. But I have a subscription that gives me 25, you can see daily searches available to me. So I don't think I'm going to be searching my own face 25 times. Um, do we want a safe search and or a deep search? Uh, uh, safe search for sure. We do not want to, um, we don't want to put porn up on the, on the line. Okay. How about a deep search? Deep search you have to pay $300 for, and I'm not sure. Oh, wow. All what right. Yeah, with the deep great. search. But yes, safe search is important. Um, and so now, so PimEyes has kind of done what Clearview did. They have a smaller database, uh, but it, you, you can get a sense from the search how well it can work. So, so now in this case, I'm actually trying to get it not to take all the cookies. And of course, all it tells me is the purposes and I understand. So and there so we go. And so a search like this, um, you, when you do a facial recognition search, it's not usually, it just gives you one result. It will give you a bunch of results ranked in the confidence that it's me. And so you see here, it only found photos of me. It didn't even have any doppelgangers. These are all me. Um, it did, when we uploaded that photo, it analyzed my face, came up with a biometric identifier for my face, and then looked through its database of, I think they have about 2.8 billion faces in their database, and then found these other photos of me with links to where they can be found. Um, you do have to have a subscription to click on the face and see where it can be found. Um, but, but you can see it like it works pretty well. And this is a company that is run by a guy who lives in the country of Georgia. The site is headquartered in the UAE and their legal services are offered by somewhere in the Caribbean. So Clearview AI has gotten a lot of attention. Tim Eyes hasn't gotten as much attention even though it's out there and like anyone can use it and you can pay you know, $25 a month and or $30 a month and you know you could use it on people in this room right now, and it's part of it's part of why I wrote this book because I am worried that this is just getting out there and we're not doing enough to choose you know the world that we want to live in. We're letting the technology dictate it. I did write about threats to children from AI, including you know deep faking their voice or you know taking a photo of a kid on a playground and doing something like this to figure out who they are, where they live. After I, um, after I published that article, PimEyes actually blocked searches of minors' faces. So um, uh, public scrutiny is, is, is kind of working a little bit um, to regulate privacy, but yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit of a wild west. and I'm worried that we are, are not doing enough about it. Um, to put it mildly. Yes. <laughs> yep. And it's been interesting that you have, in publishing, uh, both the book and the sequence of articles uh, in its run-up, you've covered all the angles, including the angles that may be ones that are challenging to a view that is salt the earth, such as the child abuse imagery identification uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean, one story I tell in this book is about a guy who came to me knowing I'm interested in facial recognition technology, and he wanted to confess how he was using this tool, PimEyes, because he wanted policymakers to know, regulators to know, because he thought that what he was doing was so wrong and that he shouldn't have access to a tool like this. And what he described to me is essentially he had a porn addiction and a privacy kink where he would watch videos of women and then he would want to know, usually because that work is so stigmatized, people use pseudonyms, he would search their faces 
and find out who they really were. You described it, you know, finding one woman's high school photos on Flickr from like her spring formal. And you just like to compile this, uh, this file of their vanilla life. And he would just keep these files. And he says he didn't act on it. He was just a peeping Tom. But that eventually he got sick of this. And so he started going through his Facebook friends and he would search for them and see if they had any risque photos. And he did find them. He would find them on revenge porn sites where you know, their name wasn't there, but their photos were. And now they were findable because we are seeing the internet kind of reorganized around biometric information around our faces. And I just think if we don't do anything about this, you know, we'll see that happen in other realms. We'll have a voice search where, you know, you upload somebody talking and then you find everything they've ever said that's on the internet. Um, a privacy activist talked a lot about, if we don't do something about Clearview AI, um, we'll have startups that do this in the DNA space, that they'll go to hairstylists and collect clippings from their customers and, you know, sequence it and create this DNA database that's just a public uh, or not a public DNA base, their proprietary DNA database that they could sell to police or to companies or whoever might be interested in that information. I see people are kind of like absorbing all this. Uh, just any quick thought on the personalities involved and maybe even the question I gather of war and peace, which is how much of this history was, as you hinted at earlier, an inevitability. This was just out there waiting for the first person in the pool to jump versus a somewhat zig and zag of particular personalities doing this and being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that what Clearview AI did was ethical arbitrage, I did want to, with this book, understand their motivations. You know, um, this is, uh, they're, they're not your typical tech founders. Uh, uh, a very ragtag crew, um, Juan Tan Tat, who has corresponded with Jay-Z apparently, um, is, you know, he was kind of a tech obsessive, just, uh, he grew up in Australia, loved computers, dropped out of college at 19, moved to San Francisco to kind of chase the tech dream, uh, was, was building Facebook quizzes and iPhone games and that Trump hair app that we mentioned. And when he first moved to San Francisco, he was pretty kind of liberal, like grew his hair long, hung out with artists, played guitar. But then he moved to New York in 2015. And as he described it to me, he said he was rad radicalized by the internet. And he really fell in with the MAGA crowd and you know, started uh, retweeting Breitbart people and uh, wrote a song about Milo Yiannopoulos and how he was unfairly banned from Twitter. Uh, and- As one does. <laughs> and went to the Republican National Convention with this guy, Charles Johnson or Chuck Johnson, who's kind of conservative provocateur and internet troll. And their idea originally was it would be great to have an app on your smartphone that you could just point at someone else at the RNC and just get information about them. And um, yeah, I mean, originally it wasn't just face recognition. They are actually, Charles Johnson is a big believer in uh, physiognomy uh, or phrenology, the kind of this idea that you can derive from people's facial features, who they really are, how intelligent they are, whether they have criminal tendencies. Um, uh, uh, so at one point, Juan Tantat was talking about after the Ashley Madison hack that happened a few years ago that exposed all the users. He said, wow, now we know all these people's names. We can look them up on Facebook, download their faces, you know, have AI crunch that and figure out what a cheater face looks like. Um, and so that was, that was their original idea. He's, he later swore off those beliefs and they moved more in the direction of just pairing uh, people's faces. Um, but yeah, it, it really came out of this conservative kind of mindset. And so I think one of the questions of the book is, uh, was it particular to these people that they came up with this tool that they were willing to kind of push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable at that point by, by Silicon Valley? And they did struggle to raise money. A lot of investors loved using Clearview AI on their own phones, but didn't want to put money into the company because they were either troubled by the background of the founders. Um, the other guy was, uh, Juan's co-founder was Richard Schwartz, who was like a New York politico who worked with Rudy Giuliani when he was mayor. He's much older. It was a really strange pairing. Um, but they were either troubled by their backgrounds or they just were worried about the legal risk. Like, was this legal to do? Um, was this data ethically sourced? 
It's uh, our intention to go to 1.30, if that's okay. Uh, is that, I'm waiting for anybody in authority to tell me that's problematic. Uh, nope, I got thumbs up, that's great. There were a number of enthusiastic hands up and I was thinking it might be great to collect some comments seriatim before landing back on you. Uh, and we can just kind of do a scan of the room as it were. And we have mics here, uh, somebody up front, uh, Patrick, feel free to tell us who you are or don't and then someone can look it up. Hi, uh, my name is Yana. I have a background in uh, biotech and genetics. Uh, so I'm not a law student here. Um, uh, I'm an alum of the college. Uh, the DNA question, the DNA um, comment reminded me of uh, something called environmental DNA, which is where researchers who are doing ecological surveys, trying to figure out what species are in a certain area, uh, have found that by taking a sample from a stream, sand, the air, uh, they can find human DNA, recognize it as such, and potentially even link it to people. Um, so that you'll need to be a hairdresser, you'll need to work at a nail salon to get people's DNA. Um, you can just be at a place, collect it, Sequencing is becoming extremely cheap and very- Like prospecting with a metal detector at the yes. beach, but now it's just a right. human detector. Yes. Right, collecting in a stream might not be very effective, but you could go on trash day and just pull a little trash out of every house and then very quickly know so, what DNA belongs to which house or which address. Yeah, I would love to know like your perspective on this and also if you think something should have been done, we should have done something a decade ago for facial recognition, what can we do now for DNA? All right, great question. Patrick, do you want to route to another upraised hand? Two folks here. I have a question over the side. Oh, I see, we're gonna alternate, that's yeah. fine. Um, earlier, you mentioned the term, um, like the police would search and if they found something credible. Um, what does that mean and who determines credibility? And what is the threat now that there's so much like deep fake technology out? Yeah, great question about whether deep fakes could frustrate the quote, descriptively effective use of this too. Yeah. Um, just building off, uh, if the toothpaste is out of the tube, and I feel like that's kind of a common argument with tech in general, um, but then there's this fang meeting or meeting of the minds early on saying, we're not gonna do it. How do we, where's the jump in point for either political regulation or industry self-regulation, like, or is it just that the toothpaste is out of the tube and technology is running and we all need to get on board? You know, like what, kind of where's the line? Yep. Let's take two more. Is the mic over here somewhere as we're alternating? Hi, so I was at the airport a number of months ago um, about to travel abroad and I was in a very long line in NSA and I noticed at, uh, somewhere there was a, a sign and some technology that you said there. NSA you might you probably meant TSA, TSA? The TSA sorry. maybe they're overlapping <laughs> yeah. okay sorry. I was just wondering um, and it said we are testing out a new facial recognition technology or I don't even know if it said facial recognition but and I just thought nobody was I don't I'm sure there were a couple of people who were paying attention but I just felt helpless in a way uh, because if there was nothing I mean, I had to go through the line to travel, and I just wonder, I just wonder about that. You know, they're testing out a new technology. We don't have a choice in the matter if we want to go to our destination, and what, a, what is that technology? And so I just started thinking a lot about that. Got it. One more, and then we'll uh, hear uh, from Kashmir again, and we'll try to synthesize as we go. Yeah. Thanks for this. I'm Brian. I'm a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center. And I was just wondering if you came across in your research uh, anything around e emotion AI and looking at a face and reading what the person is experiencing inside. Because there are companies like Affectiva that have done things like look at the face, but also like give people beer at a sports event to wear a fitness tracker so they can track their heart rate as well and sort of line up all that data and do research with it. So I was wondering if there are concerns there. <laughs> uh, and if so, like what should we be thinking about um, or doing about this in your view? So questions about DNA, questions about effectiveness and how to know what things like it's enough to proceed to um, further police investigation or even prosecution. 
and then a number of questions about what now, both retrospectively, if the cat is out of the bag, is there any way to put it back in and return to some status quo ante? And also prospectively, we don't expect that this will stand still. What lies around the corner and should we be anticipating and regulating about that? Seem like a fair characterization? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with the credibility question. Um, so, so you saw with PIM eyes that facial recognition technology can work pretty well, like there, it just paired me to me. Um, but facial recognition technology is not perfect. And, you know, sometimes it will pair you with a doppelganger. And so every kind of police officer I talk to about facial recognition technology will say, you know, it is just a lead. We would never arrest somebody based on a face match alone. That said, there has been a handful of mistaken arrests based on facial recognition technology, six that I know of. Um, and one of those did involve Clearview AI, a guy named Randall Curran Reed, who was arrested in Atlanta, Georgia, day after Thanksgiving, driving to his mom's house, gets pulled over, pulled out of his car, and put under arrest for larceny in Jefferson Parish. And he goes, where is Jefferson Parish? And they said, it's in Louisiana. He said, I've never, I've never been to Louisiana in my life. And, you know, basically there had been somebody buying purses with stolen credit cards. There was surveillance camera footage. They ran a match. It, it, uh, there's a human being who looks at the results and they thought that Randall Coran Reed was the best match. They looked him up on Facebook. He had a lot of friends in New Orleans. And based on that, basically, they sent a warrant for his arrest in, to, in, to Georgia, along with a request for extradition. So he actually spent a week in jail waiting for the Louisiana authorities to come pick him up, had to hire lawyers. Uh, the lawyers are like, why is he tied to this crime? They're lucky enough to figure out it's facial recognition technology. And so they get photos of his face, a video of his face, send it to the authorities in Louisiana, and they notice he has like a little mole that their suspect didn't have, and so they dropped the case. But that is, you know, that is crazy. Um, and so credibility is, is there something else that ties this person to the crime beyond that they look like the person? Because just looking like somebody, like no one should be arrested for the crime of just looking like someone else. And so some, but what is that? What is the other thing? And I think that's one of the questions I have when we talk about guardrails. If we are gonna use facial recognition in policing, do we want to use a database like Clearview AI that's looking through 30 billion faces, looking through probably all of us in this room to find a match to a shoplifter in New Orleans? Um, do we use it for shoplifting? Do we only use it for more serious crimes? Um, and what are the other things that you need to do? A lot of the mistaken arrests have been because they do facial recognition technology, get a match, and then put that person into a lineup, like a six, uh, they call it a six pack, where it's a, a photos of six different people and they show it to an eyewitness and they say, do you see the criminal here? Um, and then they will often agree with the computer. Yeah, this person looks the most like the person and then they arrest that person. And so that's a very dangerous practice. And yeah, I do, I do worry about a world where we have deep fakes matched with facial recognition technology. I can just imagine a way of smearing somebody's personality by seeding these like, uh, you know, the pornographic images of them on the internet and it comes out later in a face search and then creates a whole news cycle around that so um, i do think it's a concern on um, toothpaste is already out of the tube i mean i i, I don't believe <laughs> I, I don't believe that um just because a technology exists and is capable of doing this that we just have to accept it like that is why we have a world of laws and regulations and policies and we have had moments like this in our history. Um, I've been listening, I've been um, reading The Listeners by Brian Hawkman, which is about the age of wiretapping. And when the, we first saw in the United States kind of the development of small listening devices and bugs and the ability to wiretap lines. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, we won't be able to have a private conversation anymore. Conversational privacy is dead. The technology is there, we can't resist it. And then we passed laws that made it illegal to secretly listen to people. And Jay Stanley at the ACLU says, this is the reason why all of the surveillance cameras all over the United States are only recording our images and not also our conversations. We can create zones of privacy, but we do have to pass laws and then we have to enforce them. Um, and so I think one, one example of that is in the EU, they say you can't put people into these databases without their consent. 
um, or we can do it the way we like to do it here, where we say you can get out of the database. Um, or you can have a law like Illinois passed, one of the rare laws that was uh, moved faster than the technology, passed in 2008, Biometric Information Privacy Act, and this kind of addresses the DNA question a little bit. It says you can't use somebody's biometric information without getting their consent, or you face a very uh, stiff financial penalty. Of that case just settled, didn't it? Um, they, there's two different versions of it. Did the, the class action one against I think David? I just saw, I, I don't know, I have to look it up, but. It's, they've been saying it's gonna settle for a while, but they haven't, um, yeah. at least last I checked, hadn't publicized yeah. how much they were gonna pay. Um, but yeah, it says you can't use somebody's biometrics without their consent, and it works. My favorite example is Madison Square Garden, which has started using not Clearview AI, but facial recognition technology installed a few years ago to address security threats. Uh, they installed it around the time of the Emmys. So I assume it was kind of the Taylor Swift um, security threat of known stalkers that are trying to get into our concerts and using facial recognition to keep them out. Um, but there's been surveillance creep, function creep. The owner of Madison Square Garden said, well, this would be a really good way to get keep my enemies out and use this to ban lawyers who work at firms that have suits against MSG from personal injury, slip and fall suits to big shareholder litigation who thought he spent way too much money building the spear in Las Vegas. And when those people tried to get into Madison Square Garden, I actually went with an attorney who was on the ban list. You know, as soon as you walk through the doors, a security guard comes over and says, you're not welcome here until your lawsuit is dropped. And the person I went with wasn't even working on the lawsuit. It was one of her colleagues. She had her daughter with her, is that? Oh, I didn't go with her. There was a, yeah. one, a Girl Scouts troop. The mom got <laughs> turned away because uh, she worked at a law firm. Uh, she didn't work on the litigation, but everybody at the firm was banned. MSG also has a theater in Chicago, and they can't use their technology that way. Um, they're not allowed to use lawyers' biometrics without their consent. Um, and the way MSG did this is they actually scrape the lawyer's photos um, from their websites. So, so yeah, so I think laws work and we just would need to actually pass them. Uh, I don't know how soon that's gonna happen at the federal level here in the United States where we have a bit of gridlock there, but the states have been passing relevant laws. Uh, on DNA, I think the same thing, like we do have the one DNA law, GINA passed actually around the same time as BIPA, but it only regulates how employers use genetic information and insurance companies. And I, I just do wonder if we'll see an expansion of that, particularly as we are seeing law enforcement now start to, um, they're starting to access DNA that has been shared by genealogists, people like uh, um, investigating their family history and then putting it online to try to find ancestors. And police have started uh, basically going into those databases to try to match criminal suspects and sometimes victims and find out who they are. Well. Cat is at least somewhat out of the bag, but maybe best not to think dichotomously. It's Schrodinger's cat. There's still ways to try to keep at least the tail inside, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what an interesting sort of call for further study or action, uh, not just to the law students uh, and uh, lawyers among us, but to everybody where uh, there's just so many dimensions to this story. And Katherine, thank you so much for taking the time and effort in so many ways to limit it, to tell the public about it and to, to cover it in such uh, a nuanced and thoughtful way. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So Thank you. Nobody seems to have barged in to make use of the room. So if you have a couple minutes, maybe yeah, we can just mingle stay. a bit and we will turn off the webcast and the cameras.